Nightingale apply for a permit to sing? Have you seen anyone executing a bird because of its heavenly song? Have you come across a power so dark and so evil that it cannot tolerate the colour of sunflowers and daffodils? A power so satanic that it wants to burn and destroy all the angels, smearing their beautiful white wings with blood? Have you heard of a place where the writers have their pens and their arms broken? Some are even found dumped in alleyways with a blue ring printed around their necks or their throat cut. Imagine being a poet living in a place like that. Imagine writing poems about all that and not being tolerated by the powers that govern you. Imagine going to university with a long black gown and a, head and a headscarf that covers your sense of self, your womanhood, your livelihood, your youth and beauty. Imagine being intimidated, kept in the background and classified as second class citizen just because you were born a woman. When you have so much to say and have a voice as heavenly as the voice of angels to sing, but the barbed wire of silence is wrapped around your neck, suffocating all you have to say. Then you decide, this is when you decide to flee. You decide to fly all the way across the ocean, oceans and mountains across the forests and deserts to find yourself a new nest where you can rest on a branch and sing freely. Let me start with reading one of my poems in Persian just for you to get a, a feel of what Persian language sounds like and then I'll read the um, English translation for you. Dast ha ye sardo latif ashra بر شانه هایم می کشد بازی می کند بازی گوش با پیراهنم صبح خاکستری پر از هلهله زندگی است و صداهای امروز و حرفهای امروز و دردهای ساکتی که هیچ کس از آنها سخن نمی گوید صبح خاکستری پر از قصه قربت هاست و بال نقرهی کبوتران تنهایی بر صفحه آسمان سربی صبح خاکستری خانه دود سیگارهای تردید است بر فراز فنجانهای قهوه پرسش و دودو مرد و مکانی که چهره ها را یک یک می نگرند در جستجوی یک پاسخ دستهای سرد و لطیفی دارد صبح خاکستری امروز and the translation for that the poem is called The Grey Morning runs its cold delicate hands on my shoulders and playfully toys with my dress The Grey Morning is full of the murmurs of life, the sounds of today, voices of today, and the silent pains of yesterday, which nobody speaks of. The grey morning is full of the stories of exile, the silver wings of the doves of loneliness upon the metallic sky and the hoary smoke of the cigarettes of uncertainty over the coffee cups, coffee cups of unresolved questions and the dancing of the pupils of eyes that look from one face to another in search of an answer. Oh, what cold, delicate hands 
has the great National Women's Day to all of you. Remember, this is part of the huge movement all around the world. It's not just us, mm -hmm. every country. And thanks for having me here. It's very nice meeting you all. Uh, well, basically, yes, I'm a spokesperson for the campaign to free political prisoners in Iran, uh, which we call it CFPPI, just to be short. And also, uh, I was a former political prisoner. I was arrested when I was 16 years old. And uh, I was in prison for three and a half years and obviously subjected to all the thing, torture and everything that you always hear. But just because the time is limited, I'll try to just point out some of the thing about political prisoners and also since it's an International Women's Day, but women in Iran, which partly Shiri, in uh, her beautiful poems mentioned it and I relate a lot to that. And also, uh, and then if you have any question, I'll be here to, uh, to answer. Basically, uh, campaign to free political prisoners. Uh, the aims are to publicize the situation of uh, political prisoners in Iran and also build the international solidarity for them in support of political prisoners. And I'll mention more about the work. Usually when you talk about political prisoners in Iran, they ask you how many political prisoners are there? To be honest, I don't know. No one knows. And that's because it's impossible to get all the numbers. You can't do that. If I give you just a few numbers, I mean, the regime in Iran been under power for almost 33 years. And imagine, every single day, hundreds of people without exaggeration, been arrested for different reasons, which I will mention it. And just few number, like in 1988, only in three weeks, 5,000 political prisoners have been executed in prison. And this is just, just what we know. From 1981 to 1988, they said more than 20,000 political prisoners have been executed. And these are only the numbers that we know through their family Forget about those that have been disappeared and we don't know even where they are. And their families are still thinking where they are, even where their graves are, in a sense. So it is impossible in a way to find out, but this is just a few figures to let you know. One prison that I was in it, that was in the city of Kermanshah, that was uh, instead of 100, I think 200, the capacity was 200 prisoners, 600 something prisons were there. So you can imagine. How is the rest of the prison? There are many prisons that are unknown, secret, and all of it. But what I want to say, there is a huge number of female political prisoners in the prison, including myself, obviously. I think some of the points about female living in Iran, Shireen mentioned it in the poems, which is really, you know, touches your heart when you feel like someone is living in that situation. There is a huge number of female political prisoners, and there is a reason for that. Because basically, uh, see, in, we usually say that you're innocent, right? Until it's proven guilty. But in Iran, if you are a woman, you're guilty until you prove it that you're innocent. And that's impossible. Because, like in Iran, is, uh, when you look at it, what you wear, how you walk, what you say, who do you live with, where do you travel, or are you able to travel, what kind of job you take, every single thing, they've been interfered by the government and they are punishable. You might not believe it, but they are punishable. Another reason for that, and obviously women in Iran have been always aware because of the historical reasons, being always aware of their rights. But at the same time, I think one of the main reasons is that when the Islamic regime came on the power in 1979, the first attack was on women. If you Google Iranian women, 8 March 1979, you'll see an amazing video clip regarding women who marched through the streets of Tehran and other big cities against what? Against the law that Islamic regime came and said that, well, women must wear hijab. They have to obey the Islamic, code, Islamic uh, dress code and everything. So thousands of women came on the streets of uh, different cities, especially Tehran, and said, no, we want our freedom. We didn't do revolution to go back, actually. So since that moment, the battle started for 33 years. Every single day, 
every single day that was a battle for women because so if you look at it, for women in Iran, the fight for the right is not being simply a member of parliament or this and that. It's the battle uh, to be able to live. It's a fight for the right to live, to right to live, to live as a human beings, basically. I remember exactly when I was getting out of the house before getting arrested. You know, it was like I'm, pre I'm preparing myself for a battleground. It was so funny. Oh my gosh, what is the color of my scar? Uh, my scar? What do I say if the Islamic guard arrests me on the street? What do I say? How about my socks? Are they thick enough? Because these are all reasons for being punished and being arrested. And when I was in Evin prison, there was a room, two rooms actually, I think full of political prisoners. You couldn't even sleep in a sense so many of them and you know most of them were arrested because they didn't have proper Islamic dress code so therefore I mean the battle started from that time when they attacked women in 1979 and it's and it continued if you look at it and through the generation the mothers of those who actually marched through the streets of Tehran and other cities their daughters are still fighting and you might, like, for example, see pictures that women are wearing makeup, you know, head stuff, you see all sorts of hairstyle. And people might say, so what is that? How is it possible? But it's not because there is a reform in Iran. No. It's exactly because since 33 years, basically, they have been fighting. Yes, they have been raped, they have been kidnapped, they have been arrested. Do you know what? According to Islamic laws, my friend actually got raped before execution. Virgin, if a virgin goes to heaven, and according to this Islamic regime, if you're a virgin, you will go to heaven. How is possible? You're against the regime. So we'll rape you, so you're not going to heaven. This is their sick mentality. So my friend, who was 16 years old, when they executed her, a day after that, there was an Islamic guard came, brought a pack of like sweet, gave it to her mom, just one day after the execution, and saying that, well, actually, I married your daughter, and here you go. And can you imagine how would she feel? I mean, there are lots of them. I think you mentioned Nasser Institute, thousands of like Nasser Institute being in prison for what? Nothing really, if you imagine sitting here just like that, you could be executed, very simply. So uh, what I mean by that, it's not about, when you're talking about women in Iran, and obviously in prison, of course, we don't have, I mean, a well elaborate on that. In prison, uh, as a woman, you are subjected to even more punishment, sexual harassment, rape, trying to see if they can do something with you, harassing your family, all of them. There are lots of documents regarding that. But when you look at it, Yes, I mean, they've been having this battle every single day in Iran. And therefore, they have actually pushed back the regime. And now, if you see women walking on the street, it's just because they, they're, they're all in battle every single day. But then, until the Islamic regime is under power, it's not possible to have freedom for women. Of course it's not. Then, what is, well, how, we can, how can we do it? I mean, it's not... How do we do that? Like basically, it's not by attacking Iran. You hear the news every single day. Do you hear anything about women in Iran? Do you think do you hear anything about political prisoners? Nothing. It's not by I mean supporting people in Iran, helping Iranian women to have their freedom. It's not by sort of attacking Iran. It's not by sanctioning Iran actually, because it just hurt people in Iran, as we see all the scenes in Iraq. But then it's by supporting this struggle, by echoing their voices, by bringing them to the, you know, to the world to say this is their fight. So that's why I never say that I'm um, the voice of Iranian women. They all have their voice actually. I'm saying that I'm echoing their voice because they have been fighting and they're still fighting and they haven't given up under the maybe harsh situation, really ill treatment of them. But then. We're here, we're part of this international solidarity that we're talking about. I know Amnesty works a lot on the situation of Iran, especially women in Iran. And also I think what we can do here is the fact that, uh, like for example, 
a campaign to free political prisoners in Iran, uh, we're working toward building an international solidarity, and I think every single of you were part of that international solidarity. We have two projects, one of them is called Ampere Voice on His Voice, and you see the postcards there. I was going to bring one of them here. <laughs> and uh, basically we're asking everyone to be the voice of our political prisoners in Iran. And in that way you acquaint our voice, in that way you kind of supporting their families. As well as we have 20th of June, the Inter International Day in support of political prisoners in Iran. And which we had it last year, 50 uh, organizations participated in it. And this year we're going to have it again. We're going to try to highlight the situation of political prisoners in Iran. There is two lists on that table that just only a few political prisoners in Iran. If you like to write their name on the card, you're more than welcome to do that. There are some other information. Feel free to take it. And I think. To be honest, I think uh, together I strongly believe we can make a difference because so far we have pushed the Iranian government to go back. I mean, after 33 years, they want, if they want to execute someone, we have a campaign for that, other people have a campaign for that. So they, they go back and it's important. I think sometimes people come and ask us, is it really important if I sign a petition? Is it important? I think if you guys are working with Amnesty, you know how important is that actually. Last year, we sent 3,000 of those postcards to the UN um, Human Rights Commission. And it is important. Actually, that's why we, we could stop Sakina Zashtiani's story. How many of you know her? Probably you heard yeah. her name. Yeah, why did it's been campaigning exactly? Yeah. Why yeah. why they didn't stone her to death? Why she's in is probably prison? Why they didn't actually kill Nasser Institute? Mm. You know, when I was in prison, they killed sixteen classmates of mine just in one one day, in like two hours. There is no nothing like court or nothing like trial or nothing like that. But now they can't do that. One because of the struggle that people. I mean, the struggle of people in Iran, the fight they have, and second, because of the international... I mean, when I ask you who is Akin Ashtian, a few people said, I know. Why is that? It's because of the international solidarity, and that's how important is that. If we don't do that, we can't push them back. So that's why I really need your solidarity, people. You know people, you know friends and family organization that they sympathize with this cause. Ask them to join, ask them to support. There are lots of things on their web on our website that you can help and you can be the voice of the people.